But the, what I do want to talk to you about is this, which is there's this amazing gift that I've discovered in the midst of this that I, I think is something that's going to tie into what we're going to do all year in, uh, in college ministry, which is, which is what is the gospel and what difference does the gospel make in our lives, particularly around things like this, like, like real life, actual things we're struggling with and going through. And so what I, what I want to share is this gift. Um, I realized today when I was praying and thinking that outside of some really tragic, unforeseen thing, like a car accident or, you know, getting shot or something, uh, I know how I'm going to die, right? At some point, somewhere down the road, colitis is going to be the thing that kills me, unless something else beats it to it, right? But that's kind of it. And I got thinking about that because there's something really important about knowing that. Because if I know that, I know what to fight now, right? That's this great advantage of a chronic illness. That's what chronic means there, right? Chronic means death. It means it's going to kill you. Sooner or later, that's going to happen, right? And what I want you to think about for a second is that's really true in our own lives and relationships with Jesus. That the good news of the gospel of Jesus is that Jesus rose from the dead to rescue us from death. That death, by colitis, by gunshot, by car accident, any of those things, old age, they're going to happen, but they have no power over us anymore. The resurrection of Jesus is something really amazing in our lives. And if you know what's causing your death or what's going to cause your death, you don't need to treat that with fear or with this like terrible trepidation or in my case, ignorance, right? You don't need to go home and pretend, ah, it's not that big a deal, I'll leave it alone. If I ignore it, it'll go away. It's not gonna go away. It's gonna keep coming back. And it's going to keep attacking you and hospitalizing you and, and knocking you off the journey you're called to be on with Christ. So here's the gift. The gift is I know now, right? I know my body's nemesis. Know your nemesis. My nemesis is colitis when it comes to my body, right? But what is my nemesis when it comes to following Jesus? What's the thing that's just below the surface that I'd really rather not ever think or talk about that really deep down is getting in the way of me following Jesus? That's really robbing me of the grace and the life that God has for me. Hmm. This, hashtag name your nemesis, all right? Hashtag name your nemesis, put your nemesis in there. If you've got one, if you know it already, if you don't know it, just tell me you want to figure it out. And uh, and this year, when we all get back together and we start talking again, we'll chat about what that's like. All right, we'll talk about we'll talk about what some of those nemeses are. All right, I love you guys. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for praying. Peace. Good morning again. Um, I'm still in the hospital. Uh, thank you everybody for watching our video yesterday. And, uh, and discussing with me. I got a ton of emails and conversations around this idea of naming our nemesis. Hashtag name your nemesis. Uh, as we talk about that and, and thought about that yesterday and the conversations that came up, there's a couple of things I wanted to kind of follow up on and build on. And we'll do more of this throughout the school year when we get back into our preaching schedule and all that. Um, when we talk about what the gospel is and how the gospel works in our lives. But one of the things, and this is this is a brilliant, beautiful piece to me, is uh, one, of, one of my good friends, Chris, reached out and said, man, you hit on this just a little bit, but it really reminded me and it got me thinking. And it, rem it rem reminded me that one of the great difficulties in having a nemesis is that it robs you of joy in the good things of your life if you don't ever deal with it. I got thinking about that because Chris and I once were in New Orleans and we were helping tear apart this church after Katrina and, and there had been flooding everywhere and there was like this one room uh, in the Episcopal Church, it's a sacristy and it's, it's this spot where 
this, the holiest of the rooms of the church essentially where where all the like you know all the important stuff kind of behind the scenes happens and and it's and there was this great sort of amazement that that sacristy had not been destroyed uh that 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 had been just high enough out of the reach of the flood and all of that and so so chris and i were charged with kind of going in and wiping it down and and just making sure everything was all right and and we'd been done for, we'd almost finished our day and chris like peels back a little bit of wood paneling and discovers that there's this mold growing and he goes oh no and i said chris it doesn't look that bad like i don't know what i'm doing i don't know what i'm looking at but it doesn't look that bad to me like it looks like just a couple of spots and he goes no i think i think this is really bad and so then he started to pull again and went to another corner and another corner and it, we discovered that right when we thought we were done with this stuff we actually had mold in the entire sacristy and had to take it apart completely um that's that's what happens right it's it's uh, the good stuff in our life, the gifts in our life, the, the, the joys and the blessings that God's already given us, those get affected, right? Those get infected. They get, they get that, that nemesis starts to grow and rob joy in those places. So that the things that, that should be life-giving for us go away. Psalm 51, this is a psalm that's attributed to David at the time he gets confronted by Nathan. So this is this is the background story for this is second Samuel 11 and David has has not gone off to war like he was supposed to he hasn't done his job he stayed home he lusts after a married woman he takes that married woman some some Old Testament scholars say he it's an actual like rape situation he gets that he gets Bathsheba pregnant he brings her husband back her husband is has too much integrity and is too faithful and won't fall into David's plan so David kills him. He has him killed in battle so that he can marry this woman. And he thinks, it seems like he thinks he probably gets away with it, right? But the last line is so haunting. The last line of chapter 11 in 2 Samuel and the kind of the first line of chapter 12 is the Lord was not pleased with what he saw. Right? That, that David, like this, the same room had just, like, he had, he just kept going right he just kept going and it kept spiraling and spiraling and spiraling and he he hadn't dealt with even that initial sin of just not doing his job and and where that that spiraled out of control it's just lie and violence and death and destruction in psalm 51 he says, it feels like all of my bones have been broken, that my bones have been crushed, that there's no integrity left in my body. And it's a psalm we pray a lot. Like, it's, it's a psalm we know. We sing songs about it. Creating me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit with me. Open my lips and my mouth for proclaim your praise. We say this stuff all the time. But it's all in the context of David just weeping out that he's let his nemesis, this sin, this spiraling sin, destroy his life. Hashtag name your nemesis. Thank you guys. Please, again, if you're enjoying this, share it at all. I, I love it. Thank you guys for doing this with me. Um, thank you for letting me think about the, the crazy ways our physical bodies and our, our spirits are connected in the, in the weird crazy wonderful ways god's made us thanks everyone good morning uh you can tell pretty quickly that i am not in the hospital anymore so thank you so much for praying and keeping tabs on me and uh and all of you guys who have called and checked up and everything else like i really appreciate it um i got out yesterday and i'm, I'm home now and i just wanted to finish up this kind of three-part thing we've been doing on uh naming our nemesis hashtag name your nemesis uh, because I, I had promised at least one more thought on this, I think. So so I wanted to end uh, with one uh, kind of practical, maybe pastoral prayerful image or idea from the Bible that I think uh, may help us as we think about where to go next with naming our nemesis. The first thing I want to say about naming our nemesis is, is uh, it's a very 
good, I think, first step towards what the Christian church has always called confession. And kind of whatever denomination you're in or whatever background you're at, you have some version of this. So even if confession is simply, I mean, really at its most basic, if it's, if it's just saying out loud to God, this is my nemesis and this is what keeps winning, uh, please stop letting this win. That's great. That's, that's confession. Confess that. Um, but we also know confession can work in a bunch of other ways too, right? So uh, we can confess to each other. Uh, we don't, we don't, you don't need rank or order to confess. In the early church, this was uh, confess your sins to one another. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who the other one is. If they're a brother or sister in Christ who has your best interests, confess to them. Uh, and then there, there are, like we have actual, in, uh, in the Episcopal Church, we have this amazing prayer service that's, it's just confessing all these different sins that we have before God and asking God's great mercy on them. And then there's one-on-one -on -one confession with a priest and, and reconciliation and absolution and all that stuff. So use that. The, the reason those exist is because God's given those to us as tools over, over thousands of years now of people trying to live faithfully and dealing with these kinds of nemeses too. A lot of a lot of you have sent to me that, that one of your nemesis is fear or uncertainty, and that's that's clearly very normal. But it's also something that's not new. The church has struggled with this forever. Christians have struggled with that forever, and so we've developed these practices that allow us, as gifts from God, these practices, these graces, that allow us to to start naming these nemesis and putting them out loud. And here's the image that I want to leave you with because I think this is what the early church used. Jesus, at the end of his life, was in the temple and he was preaching and he was, he was, he was seemingly very angry. This last week of his life, he's trying to kind of set some things right, especially with the scribes and the people in power. And he, he had this great picture. There's this, there's this, there's this saying about Jesus and we, we, we use it a lot, but I don't know if we know that this is what Jesus is doing with it all the time. But Jesus says, um, behold, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And he asks the leaders, the religious leaders, he says, what does this mean? And they kind of sputter around a little bit and he says, this is what it means. It means if you fall on the cornerstone, that's bad for you. And if the cornerstone falls on you, that's bad for you. <laughs> I always love that picture because Jesus is, and the, the image is that these jars, right? That if you, if you drop this jar on a rock, that's bad for the jar. And if you drop the rock, on the jar is bad for the jar. Neither one of them are bad for the rock. And the, 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 how this fits is that Jesus is that cornerstone. We usually think of that cornerstone image entirely as like a building up sort of ha, the first piece of a whole house or something like that. But in the image here, the early church took this and said, we need, we need to take our, these nemesis and crush them against our rock, who is Jesus. That in the cross and resurrection of Jesus, he becomes this stabilizing force that we can take these sins to, that we can confess these sins to. And in confessing them, we're essentially throwing them and dashing them against the rock, who is Jesus. It's an image. It's, it's an image that the early church used and and has continued to use. And there's a ton of stuff we can do with that. And I actually, uh, in a couple weeks here, I'll record a podcast and we'll talk, I can talk through that piece even more, but I wanted to get you started on that. I'm not gonna do these every day for the rest of my life or anything like that, but I appreciate you guys following these three. Hashtag name your nemesis. Keep in touch with me on this Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Give me a call if you wanna have coffee or talk about it. Um, but think about that image. Crush your nemesis today against the rock who is Jesus. Love you guys. Thank you for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. See you soon.